My name is Sam Baknin and I am a columnist in Brussels Morning. And today we are going to discuss an obscure country known as Israel. Can Israel survive without the United States of America? If the United States were to completely withdraw its military and diplomatic support for Israel, the Jewish state will survive, but only as a militarized pariah. Demographic trends in the West have rendered Muslims and even Arabs more electorally relevant than the Jews, and this bodes ill for Israelis. In its hubris, Israel neglected its army, rendering it a paper tiger, a glorified militia with an air force. Israel also abandoned its defense industries and tolerated or even encouraged an abysmal brain drain. Back in time a bit, it is common knowledge that in international affairs, emotions defer to self-interest. As George Orwell noted in his masterpiece 1984, the flux of circumstance may render yesterday's foe tomorrow's friend. The allies of the United States, most notably Ukraine, the, United, the European Union, Taiwan, they would do well to learn from Israel's turbulent and bitter experience with the United States. Despite the fact that the Israeli lobby in Washington, AIPAC, used to be by far the mightiest and the best organized, backed as it is by millions of affluent and politically active Jews, Israel had been repeatedly pressured by its friend and strategic ally into compromises that subverted its national interest and even endangered its very existence. Start 1948. During the 1950s and 1960s, the United States was essentially pro-Arab. It attempted to secure the oil fields of the Middle East in the Gulf, Iraq and Iran. To secure them and remove them from Soviet encroachment by nurturing friendly relations with the region's authoritarian regimes and by fostering a military alliance with Turkey, later a part of an extended NATO. Remarkably, Israel was forced to rely on the USSR for armaments supplied via the Czech Republic. And later Israel relied on France and Britain, who were desperately trying to hang on to the smoldering remnants of their colonial empires. And so in 1956, Israel, in collusion with France and Britain, attempted to prise open the critical recently nationalized waterway, the Suez Canal, by invading the Sinai Peninsula, then as now a part of Egypt. The USA coerced Israel into a humiliating public retreat and threatened the fledgling, fledgling state with economic, military and diplomatic sanctions if it did not comply with American demands without a do. During the 1960s, even when America did rarely sell weapon systems to Israel, it made sure to make the same armaments available to Israel's avowed and vociferous enemies, Egypt and Jordan. By 1967, the United States has granted the Hashemite Kingdom of Transjordan far larger sums of military and foreign aid than it did its neighbor to the west, Israel. President Johnson was a staunch supporter of Israel, and yet in the run-up to the Six day war, Days War, the Johnson administration summoned Israeli politicians and military, military leaders to Washington and publicly chastised and berated them for refusing to succumb to American pressure and yield to Arab demands. But these Arab demands amounted essentially to the dismantling of the Jewish state by economic and diplomatic means. Secretary of State Dean Rusk went as far as blaming Israel for the war. A diplomatic solution, he insisted, was possible had Israel shown more flexibility. The deliberate or mistaken Israeli attack during the conflict on the USS Liberty an American intelligence gathering ship, moored in international water as it was, did not help bilateral relations any. Still, 
Israel's decisive victory over the combined forces of numerous Arab states, many of which bore Soviet arms, has changed perceptions in Washington and among the Jews. Here was a military democracy that could serve as a bulwark against Soviet expansion in the Middle East, a regional cop, a testing ground for new weapons, a living, breathing demonstration of the superiority of American arms, an intelligence gathering front office, and a frontline base in case of dire need. Israel's standing was thus transformed from an outcast to a major non-NATO ally overnight, a status officially granted Israel in 1987. Israel felt sufficiently secure in its newfound pivotal strategic role to reject a peace plan forwarded by then Secretary of State Will Rogers in 1970. Yet even in the heyday of this special relationship, Israel refrained from defying the United States and feared repercussions of any disagreement, major or minor. This hesitancy and dread were not confined to the political echelons. The entire population of Israel were affected. People of all walks of life engaged in reading the tea leaves of the mood in Washington and what should Israel do to placate its fickle, thuggish and overbearing partner. And so despite numerous warning signs that it is about to be attacked by superior Arab forces in 1973, the Israeli leadership gambled with the country's very existence and did not launch a preemptive strike, having been cautioned not to act by President Nixon and his Jewish Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. When Israel repelled and encircled the invading Egyptian army, Kissinger called Israel's ambassador in Washington, Simcha, Simcha Dinitz, and instructed him to not pursue a military victory. When Dinitz protested, Kissinger told him that disobeying the United States and destroying the aggressor's remaining forces on the ground was an option that simply did not exist, quote, unquote. Kissinger then proceeded with shuttle diplomacy aimed at pressuring Israel into ceding most of the land it conquered in the last two wars in return for a mere ceasefire. Whenever Israel resisted any of his dictates, However, inconsequential, Kissinger would publicly threaten Israel with abandonment and even sanctions. This modus operandi continued throughout President Carter's years in office. Even in the early Reagan years, Israel was berated and threatened on a regular basis, owing to its invasion of Lebanon and its rejection of yet another American-imposed peace plan in 1982 and then again in 1988. The Reagan administration also openly consorted with the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, at the time still an unrepentant anti-Jewish terrorist organization. Yet, throughout these very public and advertent humiliations, the USA remained Israel's main backer. Friendship and bullying appear to be two inalienable facets of the same coin of American-Israeli relations. The two countries signed a Memorandum of Understanding in 1981, formed a joint military political group in 1983, conducted joint air and naval exercises in 1984, stockpiled American weapons and materiel on Israeli soil, and signed a free trade agreement in 1985. Israel has also been the recipient of $3 billion annually until 2004, one-third of all American foreign aid, starting in the early 1980s. At the very same time, then Secretary of State James Baker reprimanded Israel for its expansionist policies, and his boss, President Bush Sr., insisted that East Jerusalem, the very soul and heart of the Jewish state, was an occupied territory. Blowing hot and cold on the special relationship, strained these relationships to the hilt, to the breaking point. Disagreements and misunderstandings proliferated as the USA began to micromanage Israeli affairs, telling the country how to conduct its investigation into incidents and even how to hold elections 
for the Palestinian delegation to a peace conference. With the first Gulf War imminent in 1990, Bush affirmed the United States commitment to Israel's existence and security, but only a year later, when Iraq attacked Israel with Scud missiles and Israel heeded America's request to not retaliate, did the relationship between the two asymmetric allies thaw. Israel was granted loans, albeit under the condition that it freezes all settlement activities in the West Bank. Relations between Israel and the administration of President Bush, the son, started off on the wrong foot with recriminations and accusations, only to be rendered an intimate collaboration by the terrorist attacks of September 2001. In the throes of an umpteenth honeymoon, Israel could do no wrong. But history taught us that such phases were invariably followed by discord. Indeed, under the Obama and Biden administrations, Prime Minister Netanyahu's far-right governments pushed the relationship to the brink, especially in the wake of the October 7 Hamas terrorist attacks. Israel has consistently jeopardized both its national security and its interests to placate American impetuous demands and petulance and to cater to its allies' geopolitical and global economic interests. Two examples. At America's vehement and minacious behest, Israel has ignored Syrian offers to negotiate a peace accord. Similarly, Israel has cancelled the sale or maintenance of proprietary weapon system, systems to China, Venezuela and other countries the US deemed unfriendly to it. When Israel dared to service and upgrade an unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, that it had previously sold to China, it was harshly penalized. Joint development programs, shipment of military equipment and regular communication between the departments of defense of the two so-called allies were all suspended. Acting as the latter-day equivalent of a colonial or imperial master the USA demanded from Israel a detailed report about dozens of transactions with mainland China, the right to supervise and inspect Israel's military equipment sales supervision system, and an effective veto power on all future arms sales. In view of this deranged lability, it is shocking that Israel has allowed itself to become dependent on American armaments and willingly shunned all other geopolitical alternatives, such as Russia and China, other allies of the United States, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, to mention but two, they have been hedging their bets fervently. They have been edging closer to Russia and China, even Iran. Israel's addiction to American lucre and weapon system may well prove to be Israel's undoing and definitely constitutes an existential risk.